North Carolina took care of an undermanned Florida A&M team at home last week, but the stakes are completely different this week as the Tar Heels travel to Boone and try to avoid being the Michigan Wolverines playing at App State. Let's get into it. You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Friday, September 2nd, 2022. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and joining me is the man, Anthony Pagnata. It's so good to have him on. Uh, We want to thank you for making Locked on Tar Heels your first listen or your first watch every single day. Please don't forget that the show is free and available anywhere you get podcasts, so it's really easy. Subscribe for free right now to make sure you don't miss a second of your team every day. For those of you watching on YouTube, would love it if you would smash the like button and leave some comments about this weekend's game. By the way, today's episode is brought to you by Bet Bet BetOnline has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Okay, Mr. Anthony, welcome in. Thanks so much for joining me. Great to have you, brother. Yeah, hey, I appreciate you having me on too, man. Uh, I am ready to talk some Tar Heel football. Uh, I got to tell you, it's uh, a much different feel here uh, a couple of weeks into the season now uh, than it was really in the off season, and I'm excited. I think this is one of those games that we all had circled on our schedule, and I'm ready to break it down <laughs> here with you, man. Yes, absolutely. So for those who don't remember, North Carolina and App State have played once before. It was in Mac Brown's first season back in Chapel Hill, Sam Howe's freshman season. Tar Heels hosted and lost 34-31. So now they go back. It's going to be a crazy environment there in Boone, North Carolina. And that's where I want to start is with that revenge. What do you think that does for a team, Anthony? Well, I mean, it certainly plays a factor. There's no doubt about it. I think that you also kind of combine that with the fact that, you know, that is one of Mac Brown's former teams that he's coached, yes, coached there yes. in 1983. And as we know, the other team that he used to coach, Florida State, he has never beaten either. So <laughs> yeah. I think that's certainly a factor. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of these guys, most of these guys were not around for that 2019 matchup a lot of the guys that are going to play um you know big time roles but I do think that there are enough guys that are still on this roster that you are going to have guys that say look this is this is a big deal to us you know we had that game we thought we had that game in our hands in Keenan Stadium back in 2019 yeah and it got away from us um this is our chance to go on the road and to prove that you know all that talk about App State owning the state is no longer true and that we are getting the best talent from the state of North Carolina for yes. a reason. So I definitely think it's it's going to serve a, a purpose. I think, you know, it's just there's been enough time between it where there are some guys on the roster, a majority of them which are pretty big contributors, primarily on the defensive side of the ball, that weren't around for that matchup. So I'm not sure if this was played back in, let's say, 2020, 2021, maybe a little bit different. So it'll be a factor, but I don't know if it's as big of a factor as you know some of these other home-and-homes that Carolina's (laughs) had recently. Like the uh, NC State game to close off the regular season will be <laughs> this year. Uh, we did. It was really cool. I loved hearing Drake May getting excited about like, hey, we owe them one. We heard him say that after last week's game, and that's good. Now, you talked about them going on the road, and that's where I want to head next is inside the stadium there in Boone. Like, this should be an absolutely electric atmosphere. I know it's an, a noon kick, which kind of stinks. You'd love to see it under the lights. But, man, that place is going to be rocking. And uh, what do you think that does to to a young quarterback, to uh, defense trying to figure out who they are under a new coordinator for the first time, communication, all of those kind of things? Well, I mean, it's definitely something that Carolina has got to be able to navigate because, I mean, we saw it early last year and the environments are, you know, I I don't know how comparable they are because when Virginia Tech is good, when they, you know, open a season like they did, that's one of the toughest environments in all of college football to play in. But you're right. This is this is a whole new level for App State. This is the most fans that they've ever had coming into Kid Brewer Stadium Their fan base is excited. They think that this is yet another chance to sort of prove themselves and show everybody that they really are the best team in the state of North Carolina. So it's going to be a wild environment. And, 
you know, in terms of the mindset, I mean, Drake May, he certainly played in environments before. I remember I went and saw him in high school, and yeah. uh, he went and played in one of the toughest road environments that I've seen at the high school level in really anywhere that I've been, which is Richmond High School uh, out in Rockingham, North Carolina. It's it's a, a crazy environment. A lot of locals come out there. I mean, there mm. were about 10,000 people there. So it's not comparable to what this is. But what I'm saying is this is a guy that's had some experience going into environments before. So I don't know. He, he's a pretty even keel guy, very similar to his brother, Luke, and, of course, his dad, Mark. Mark. So yeah. I don't know how much it really throws them off. It's more about how does this throw off the team as a whole? Because you're talking about a team that has not won away from Keenan Stadium uh, since they went on the road, uh, you know, just prior to the Orange Bowl um, yes. when they went down and played Miami. That was the last yeah. time that they won back in 2020. So it's 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 definitely going to be a factor. And I, I think that it, Carolina, the best way to address that is to go out there and punch this team in the mouth. Yes. If you score yes. early on them. If you take that environment away, as long as you don't turn the football over or make mistakes that brings that environment back into it, you've done your job. Yeah, man, that's so well said. I, I Yeah, maybe people don't remember. Carolina did not win a single road game last year. And uh, man, that just heaps even more pressure on this road environment. Very excited to see it. Now, obviously, heading into this year, Anthony, there's a ton of question marks for this team. And it feels like you started to get little snippets of answers to those last week but against an FCS opponent I feel like you can't really fully get all the answers you're looking for you're not rolling out the whole playbook because you don't want to put everything on tape what what are some things you think maybe we learned last week and what are some things you think maybe we didn't learn yet well I think we learned that we've got a legitimate quarterback and I think yeah. that a lot of people will go to well they were missing their they're really superstar pass rusher, a guy that's going to go on and play at the NFL level and do a really good job of it in Isaiah Land. And they were also missing B.J. Bowler, who led them in interceptions a year ago. <laughs> but at the same time, you're talking about a guy that looked about as good as you can look in an opener. And, you know, the five touchdown passes are one thing, you know, freshman record uh, in their first start for a Tar Heel quarterback. But when you go in and you look at a stat that I saw the other day, which he became just the second quarterback in the last 15 years to throw five touchdown passes and complete 75% of his passes in the first game uh, that he started, only Jameis Winston has done that. So when you start getting into that category where you're being compared to Heisman winners, that's a really good – I mean, that's something that you should feel pretty confident about. And the other thing is – it's just it's go by the eye test. This was a guy that looked under control the entire night. Yes. He did not yes. look like a guy that was playing in his first game. He made pretty much every right decision that you could. He spread the ball around, and it looked like it, it, he picked right where he left off in, in high school, picked up right where he left off, and it looked flawless. Um, so I think you learned a lot about him. I think you learned that maybe – Maybe not that Omari and Hampton and George Petaway are the one and two and everybody else is behind them yet, but you learn that the learning curve for these guys is really not that steep. And yeah, that's something absolutely. that with the skill position players, I think we always kind of know that it's not quite as difficult to pick up on that type of stuff. The, the, you know, in terms of the scheme and everything like that, it's more about, you know, for those guys getting settled quickly. And for Amari and Hampton, I mean, the fact that he is the guy that was the summer enrollee is shocking to me if, if you just yes. look at him because he looked yeah. more ready than Petaway. And yep. that's, and I thought Petaway looked pretty good too, but he, he looks exactly like all the comparisons say a freshman Javante Williams. I know. Um, Tim Hasselback compared him to Natro Means. He yes. looks the part of that type of dual threat running back that Carolina wants in that backfield. So I think you learn that. Um, and you know, other than that, I think yeah, I, I think you learn maybe a little bit about that that pass catching room just in general. You've got some guys that um, I think are, are going to be bigger factors than they were a year ago. Um, I thought I thought the route that was run by Gavin Blackwell on his touchdown was one of the best yes. routes I've ever yes. seen in my life. I don't think enough <laughs> people are giving him credit. When you go back and watch, I mean, he pretty much takes a defender out of his shoes and catches the ball to free himself up. Like that is 
That is what Phil Longo wants for this offense. So I think you learn that. The thing is, the defense, I don't know how much you learned about that defense. Everybody yep. wants to rush to these overreactions and say, man, Gene Chizik, this just isn't going to work out the second time. I don't really know how much you learn outside of the fact that Power Eccles is a stuff. Is a dude, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and I think you're spot on with all of that that you just said, everything you said about the offense and, and the defense there. I think that was where there are more question marks, especially missing some uh, of our secondary guys for the majority of the game, and including Legend Cavazos, who we'll talk about in just a minute. And so, yeah, I, that is where I'm more anticipating what are we going to see from Gene Chizik's defense in week one, but Carolina's second game. And so here's how we're going to do this, folks. We're going to get to a break. After we do, we're going to talk about four things we're looking forward to when Carolina has the ball, and then four things we're looking forward to when App State has the ball. We'll do that in just a second after I tell you this PSA from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Are you one of those people who thinks it's okay to drive stoned? What's the worst that can happen? You end up driving below the speed limit? It's no big deal, right? wrong. The truth is your reaction times slow way down when you're high. You not only put yourself in danger, but everyone around you. Talk about a buzzkill. Stop kidding yourself. It's not okay to drive high. If you've been using marijuana in any form, do not get behind the wheel. If you feel different, you drive different. Drive high, get a DUI. All right, hard right turn back into talking about Carolina football here, Anthony. Hey, listen, don't don't be smoking drugs, bro. Okay, you learn learn your lesson there, and let's move on. So um, let's look at when North Carolina has the ball against App State. I know there's a gajillion things we could look at and talk about, but let's let's just say four things that we're looking for when North Carolina has the football. Well, I mean, first of all, it's, you know, can Drake May sort of carry over his performance yes. against Florida A&M? Uh, one of the biggest things that I said heading into last weekend was, hey, just get Drake May in a rhythm um, because he won this job for a reason. And, yeah. you know, let's see if he can settle in. And he did. He did more than that. Well, let's see if now he can sort of carry that over because, this is one of those games where I think, you know, all of us kind of know it in the back of our mind. Even if we believe in this Tar Heel defense and we think that they're going to show up and play a lot better than they did last week, which I think is certainly possible, yeah. this is a game where you're going to need to score points. I, I think it's, uh, in my mind, it's a game where you've got to get to 30 or you're probably not coming out of there with a win. So your quarterback's got to be in rhythm. And really, he's just got to be able to handle himself in a road yeah. environment. So I want to see that. Two, you know, what about this offensive line? Is this an yes. offensive line that, you know, can continue to build off of what they did last week? Look, they didn't allow a single negative play last week. And Gosh. that's amazing. That is yes. tremendous. Yes. People will say it's an against an FCS opponent, but look at where this offensive line was last year as opposed to where it is now. But now against a team that is going to be hungry to prove themselves in App State, Granted, they do lose a lot of guys on that defensive side of the ball. Can you sort of put the foot down and, you know, move those guys out of the way on the offensive side of the ball, both in the run game and can you protect your quarterback? I, I thought they did a good job with both of those things. Maybe yeah. a little bit earlier in the game, you want to see their run blocking, particularly on yeah. the interior, get going because yeah. they struggled yeah. a little bit with that early. But I think, you know, if they, if, if they can extend upon that, they're going to have a great chance. Um, three, you know, I, I think you want to see this team execute in the red zone. I think they've yeah, done a good, good job of that, you know, from time to time. But that's been one of those things that Phil Longo has been criticized heavily uh, about when it comes to some of these close games. And it feels like this is going to be another one of those close games. Also, the big thing is, is we don't know anything right now about Noah Burnett. He did not even attempt a field goal in the first that's game. Right. Of yeah. the season. So do you really want to put a guy like that out there? And the first time he has to hit, you know, a, a field goal of significant length is against App State on the road in that environment? Probably not. You want to see your red zone offense be able to capitalize when they get down there. And the fourth thing is really it's it this is another thing that's kind of focused on the offensive line, but I think it's just in general. Carolina 
you know, cannot shoot themselves in the foot when they're on offense. And that means yeah. they can't turn the ball over, which really hasn't been their problem. They did it a little bit, you know, in the game against Virginia Tech last year. Against Georgia Tech, of course, they had three fumbles. But outside of that, a lot of their losses weren't because they had turnover issues. Sure. The big problem were the penalties, primarily on the offensive line. Can they limit those? Can they not put themselves in these big, you know, second and third and long situations? Because if they get into those types of situations, you're only putting more pressure on your young quarterback, on that offensive line unit as a whole, and on the young uh, re receiving group that uh, is going to probably have to step up at least a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we saw that like in that two minute drill right before the half last week, it's mm -hmm. looking like you might have a little bit of momentum. You get a holding call on, I think it was maybe Ed Monolis. I don't remember for sure. You're um, right. Yep. But, and, and that, at that point is just like back now, thankfully you end up getting that uh, interception from storm duck and you get mm -hmm. some points going into halftime, but um, that's exactly right. Um, and, and no turnovers last week. So we're seeing that, but you got to do it on the road. I love that. Let me just, I'll add a couple in uh, that mm -hmm. I had that you didn't touch on yet. So it won't be a full four for me, but one of the, one of the things I'm going to be watching for is if Josh Downs is either out or limited, which it, it seems like it's projecting that way. We, Anthony and I heard a little bit of that just before we started recording, unfortunately. Um, I, I think he's trended down as the week has gone on. That's never how you want to see it play out. Um, but if he is out or limited, who steps up at receiver? Is it Kobe Pesor? Uh, Do we see the emergence of freshman beast Andre Green Jr. that everybody's been clamoring about? I, I think that's one of the big things to watch is, man, if your, your stud isn't out there, where does Drake May go? Now, thankfully, he spread it around last week. I think 10 different receivers caught a ball, although some of that was from Jacoby Criswell as well. Number two for me would be in that same vein, man, watch these tight ends. Last week, all three of them, um, Bryson Nesbitt and Copenhaver and Morales, all caught at least two passes, and Nesbitt and uh, Morales both caught a touchdown. And so we had heard all three would be involved, and man, they certainly were. And so I think um, you really will see some of that. If necessary, in fact, there was at least one, maybe two plays where Bryson Nesbitt started in the backfield alongside off to Drake May's left. And so really interested to see some of those packages. And then the third and final thing I'll mention is, is kind of where you touched on in the first segment there, Anthony, is what what kind of encore are we going to see from these two rush, freshman running backs in, in this week's depth chart? DJ Jones is still a top uh, at RB1 there, but man, like if if they, in particular Hampton, put on a show like last week, uh, 14 carries, over 100 yards, two tutties, like, I mean, it's not going to be very long before, as you said, he starts working his way up and maybe Petaway as well. That cut Petaway had on his touchdown run was unbelievable. And One of the so, best uh, I've seen, man. Yes, absolutely. And so it... You, I'm so tempted to be like, man, that is that is Michael Carter and Javante Williams two years from now. Mm -hmm. But we got we got to wait. That uh, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Well, well on the one that. thing I will say, the reason why DJ Jones is probably listed at the top there is because one more proven receiver out of the backfield, and two, and and look. He had a he had a rep. The the first touchdown of the game, he gets blown by, and Drake May gets lit up as he makes it the pass throw. Pro. Yeah. But yeah. he is he's a pro, more proven pass protector than those other yeah. two, which is a huge element of being in that backfield. Yes. So that's probably the reason why he's still atop the depth chart. Absolutely. That's a great call. The big knock always on freshman running backs is how are they in pass pro? Got to mm -hmm. prove yourself there if you want to get snaps and be on the field. Great stuff there, Anthony. Love those insights. Now, let's turn our attention to where uh, Carolina is on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, four things you're looking for there. Well, first of all, you know, this is I think both sides of the ball, you got to win the line of scrimmage, but primarily on the defensive side of the ball. In this game, you've got to win the line of scrimmage for Carolina. Look, they did some good things there last week. There's no doubt about it. The pressure numbers were pretty good, but I don't know. It was just uh, there was something when you were watching that game where you felt like this team should be in more control of that uh, of that line of scrimmage. Yeah. 
And it just didn't seem like they were ever really able to grab it until very late in the game. Um, I want to see them be able to get after the quarterback a little bit more, but they're going to have to get help on the back end as well because of the quick passing game that they weren't able to contain last week. You, you didn't really see Florida A&M drop back that much until they got later into the game. And by that point, you were starting to see some fatigue set in. But I want to see this defensive line sort of control uh, the, the line of scrimmage, especially against the run game, because this run game for App State is going to be one of the toughest ones that Carolina faces all year uh, with Cameron Peoples, Nate Noel in that backfield. They've got Amani Marshall also who transfers in from Wake Forest. So they've got three guys that they can roll out there really at any time uh, that can sort of, you know, that they can pick up yards if, if they want to. Um, I, I think that's one thing that Carolina has got to be aware of. Um, you know, it, the second thing, it's got to be, what does this secondary look like? Uh, yes. I'm going to be yeah. focused on that for sure. Um, and look, if Tony Grimes is able to play, that would be huge for this group. Um, but as of right now, I think the mindset in that building has to be, hey, we're preparing for yes. whichever scenario. We need to be ready to go if he can't play. Um, and more than likely, that means that, look, even if Legend Cavazos is able to play, more than likely, you're still going to start Dante Balfour and Storm yeah. Duck because yeah. if Cavazos can play, he's only coming off of one week of practice after missing right. a bunch of fall camp. So you need those guys to step up. Uh, the third thing that I'm going to be looking for uh, is can, you know, Power Echols sort of carry over that performance that he had in the <laughs> first game. Very similar to Drake May. He was outstanding. Um, and I really am not that concerned about him not being able to carry it over. But here's the thing. We've seen this from time to time with Tar Heel linebackers. I'll go back to the Orange Bowl game against Eugene Asante. Yeah. One of my bold yeah. predictions that I had last year coming into the year was that Eugene Asante would lead the team in tackles. <laughs> he didn't even come close. So, He's an Aubrey now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I'm just – I want to believe, and I, and I think Power Eccles is definitely more talented, but show me in this game, a game where yeah. we're going to need yeah. you to be the leader of that defense that you can step up. And the fourth thing, this is something that I've heard from a lot of Tar Heel fans, and I'll be interested to see what it looks like. Was Gene Chizik really kind of holding back on some things? Was it a vanilla defense that he was playing against an FCS opponent? Or is this, you know, kind of what the defense is going to look like and these guys simply did not execute? Because – I've heard both sides of it. So I need to figure out, is this a defense that really just struggled to pick up on Gene Chizik's scheme? Or is this Gene Chizik really just trying to keep things rather plain so that going into this game against App State, he can sort of turn things up and be a little more aggressive? Yeah, that, that's such a – I'm same same thing, Anthony. I've heard both sides of that coin all week long. I've heard people complaining. I've heard people saying, ah, just you wait. There's some stuff, in, you know, and it's like – all right, let's just wait till noon on Saturday and we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. So, um, man, honestly, everything I had was just about what you had. The only things um, I'll, I'll throw out from my end of things is I, I think I'm excited to see like almost this power Eccles said gray back and forth. Like, I feel like they'll probably switch off as leading tackler here. And so I think it's just going to be fun to watch those two linebackers just really trade off. Like, man, I'm getting after it really interested to see how they control this powerful run game that you're talking about. And uh, with, with having to have all that smash mouth football, will we see more of Rara Dilworth this week coming mm -hmm. in to um, just spell them a little more than he uh, needed to do last week. Um, Carolina had two takeaways last week. That was one of the hard things for me often with Jay Bateman is, man, we are just not getting the ball from the other team, not forcing takeaways. Carolina had two. Um, honestly, Storm Duck should have had a pick six on the first third down of the game, I thought. Like, just had yep. it right there. I think he had a clean field in front of him. And then uh, there was that almost other fumble. And I think it was Travis Shaw that fell on it, maybe. Uh, big, big freshman guy. And Yeah, I think um, you're right. Yep. And so Carolina truly could have uh, had four uh, takeaways last week. And so I'm looking like, hey, can Carolina go in, in in this running game, get some strips, whatever it may be, make some opportune plays in the passing game? And can they get up to three takeaways? Like just get one higher than they were last week. Is there that noise in it? And, and you need those things, especially on the road, to work at turning the tide in your favor. And, and with that push, I really thought, 
like we had that Noah Taylor sack early in the game. And then think, and I was like, oh man, getting after it, getting into it. Mm -hmm. But things kind of slowed down. I think three total sacks was it uh, last week. I can't remember for sure. Yep. Um, but like, man, can, can that more consistent push that you're talking about be there? Uh, but at the end of the day, this, this four, two, five unit has to be all in together. And, and I think that's part of it. Um, they said on the broadcast last week, like, Hey, this is Gene Chizik's first game he's called, or maybe it was coach Brown that said it for, it was, it was coach Brown that said it post game. This is the first game Gene Chizik's called in like five years. And so maybe now that he's got his feet wet, maybe that factors into it, just all sorts of stuff. We're going to have to wait and see on that. You've already talked about some of the injuries we're watching. Will Cavazos play? Won't he? Will Tony Grimes play? Won't he? The secondary is going to have some question marks there. Absolutely, folks. Just like Anthony said, they're going to have contingencies in place for all of that. Thankfully, uh, we're so much work on building up more and more and more depth across the board. So, Anthony, great stuff from you, man. Thank you so much for all that. I as we get ready to wrap up, any other takeaways from you, other things that we didn't get to talk about that you uh, would want to bring into the conversation? I mean, not really. I just think we're in for a, another really good game. I think most Tar Heel fans kind of know that. Um, I know there are a lot of people that are confident, but I feel like most people are probably confident that Carolina comes away with a win. Um, and I, you know, I think I, I do think that that's probably, you know, that that's the direction that I'm leaning in for sure. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that is going to be a big factor also to keep an eye on that, um, you know, I think kind of works with both sides of the ball is which team has the advantage in this game based on the fact that Carolina played in week zero. Because Matt yeah, Brown mentioned it in good. his press conference. He said, that's look, good. we've been out there. We know what we have to do. But so does App State. They've seen us. They know what we're going to throw at them. We don't know anything about them. So uh, is Carolina the team that has the advantage? I would I would like to think so because you're going to get to iron some of those things out. And, you know, again, it kind of ties in with that question that I was asking there uh, towards the end of when, when Carolina's on defense uh, of whether or not, you know, Gene Chizik's defense was being, you know, was – kind of a little vanilla. If it is, and Carolina can throw some new wrinkles in there, and they've yeah. adjusted to some of the struggles from a week ago, it could be a really good night for Carolina. Absolutely. But um, I think, you know, it's going to be a tremendous game. I'm I'm on the opposite side of you. I am very, very glad as a Toriel fan that this is a day game because if this was a <laughs> night game all day for these guys to party and get ready for this yeah. game, it would be unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> so, it, it, look, get out there at 12 o'clock. I'm like Mac Brown. If we could play this game at 8 a.m., let's do it. And <laughs> Take uh, care let, of business and get out. Guys got. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and perhaps there's a, a big thing to that. You talked about that game at Lane Stadium to kick off last year. That was mm -hmm. a Friday night. Carolina was not ready to go. And so I think that's the biggest thing for me is something that you said earlier, get out there and smash them in the mouth from the beginning. Do like Carolina looked inept against Virginia tech that night. And so I, I I'm with you. That's probably the biggest takeaway. And the biggest thing I'm looking for is how does Carolina start this game? Uh, score predictions, Anthony, let's do that. And then we will get out of here. Where, where's your head at on it? I, I got a 31, 28, Carolina. I think it's going to be a back and forth affair, but I like the way that Drake May played in that first game. I like the way the freshman running backs played. Uh, you know, I'm a little, little hesitant because I, that was the score I had in my mind uh, before we kind of found out what we knew about Josh Downs. Uh, yeah. But I, I still think this Tar Heel offense, Phil Longo, I, I trust him. Uh, you know, there are some Tar Heel fans that have questions about him. I don't. I think Carolina gets it done in the rock. They pull out a close one and pretty much return the favor to App State from that close one they played in Keenan in 2019. Nice. I was going to go in identical return the favor, 34-31. So I'm just right there with you, just right above you. And uh, for me, I'm going to go with that untested Noah Burnett field goal as time expires to walk off winners and get out of there. How crazy would that be? Trying to give me a heart attack. <laughs> Trying to give me a heart attack, Isaac. It's only the second game of the season, Anthony. We're going to get there, brother. Hey, folks, if you have an opportunity, please, would you help me express your thanks to Anthony for hopping on? Great insights, great content. Look forward to more of that this season. But as for today, that's it for this episode of Locked on Tar Heels. 
That's it for this week of Locked on Tar Heels. Coming up next week on Monday, we'll have our recap of the App State game. And by that point, we'll know everything that happens. You can follow the show on Twitter at Locked on Heels. You can follow Anthony at HTB Anthony. Make sure you check out the Heel Tough blog. That thing's legit. And you can follow me on Twitter at Isaac Shade. Now, for your second listen, go check out the Ultimate Pro Football Preview 22, an eight-episode extravaganza to get you ready for this year's NFL season. The local team experts of the Locked On Podcast Network and Odyssey NFL Insiders all combining into one Ultimate NFL Preview. Search for Ultimate Pro Football Preview 2022 on your Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Folks, we hope you have a great weekend. Enjoy the game. Don't go too crazy, whatever happens. And remember, it's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. Until next week, peace.